So here we are. Richard Tice is here. Very good morning to you. He's what a splendent in his England well, scarf. Well, I, I couldn't resist, Mike, yes. uh, bringing my scarf because I was there on Wednesday night and it was the what most... Night. It was an unbelievable night. Yeah. You know, it felt like we were returning to some form of normality. I've walked down Wembley Way, mm. but to do that again, it literally brought a tear to my eye. Yeah. And that doesn't happen that often. It was deeply, deeply yeah. emotional. And actually. also it had everything, really, didn't it? The game itself, because it was it was terrifyingly kind of tense. It was terrible. They scored first. England got an equaliser. But then it was all kind of like, oh, is it going to end up in penalties? And then Harry Kane gets the penalty, misses the penalty. Know, it was. It, it had all <laughs> of that. It was a complete wild roller coaster. Yeah. I mean, you know, it really was like being at a roller coaster yeah. park. Brilliant. It, it had and it, it all. And it sounded loud as oh, hell. Oh, yeah. I mean, forget, you know, whatever it was, 65,000. And it yeah. felt like 165,000. Yeah, brilliant. The excitement, the enthusiasm. And I have to say that, you know, just the, the goodwill, the friendliness, it really was a unique moment. And I'm quite sure uh, the final will be the same on, uh, you know, on, on Sunday night. Yeah. And I just couldn't resist the opportunity. I mean, we're not going to get this chance very much, Mike. So um, this is actually an English champagne. I can see. An English fizz. And yes. I just thought we had to have this opportunity to celebrate. Yes getting into the final. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and in a way to hopefully to toast uh, uh, Gareth Southgate, his team, and and possibly to wish them a very, very good bit of luck on yeah. Sunday night. Well, because, I mean, I've got a great saying, it's better to be lucky than good. Um, and <laughs> obviously be great to be both. But, I mean, if you've got to choose, I mean, they were quite lucky on the, on Wednesday night. England. Yeah, but, you know, and, you, and you make we, your own luck. But you know what? You know, England deserves a bit of luck from time to time. Very good. Here we oh, go. Oh, so there we go. That's a good a sound, isn't down. it? It's a chapel down. It is a chapel down. Very yep, nice. A chapel down brute, non-vintage. And, uh, you know, I love buying English wine also, and English champagne. you know, this champagne. is the best time of the day to drink um, fizz because uh, for your digestive system, apparently, late at night, it's not a good idea, time to drink it. But this is the perfect time to drink Champagne breakfast. I used to go to uh, a pub just off the Farringdon Road when I was in Fleet Street years ago uh, where they would do a champagne breakfast. You could have a full English and a bottle of Verve Clicquot. Oh, very nice It was nice absolutely too. brilliant. It's uh, 7.30 in the morning. Now, there let me see are. if I can um, reach that because I'm going to just... There we go, there we go. There we go. Thank you very much. Well, listen, here's well, to you, Richard Tice. Here's, here's most important. Here's to us. And here's to England. Here's to England. The football and St. Team, George. And St. George. Very and uh, the very best on Sunday mm. night. Fantastic. Mm. Marvellous. That is the greatest, the greatest idea I think you've ever had. Never mind <laughs> leaving the European Union. Well, <laughs> I mean, this is great. This is the way to kick off the, well, uh, the weekend. You've got to keep it? looking forward. You've got to keep looking for yeah. new good ideas. But no, yeah. I mean, it, it, there's no question. It's, it's exciting in the nation. And what I love is so many people who've never watched a game of football suddenly enjoying it, becoming experts in it. Yeah. Um, I think it's it's good for the soul. It's, well, it's good for the confidence the of the nation. It really question. is united. Cause, and, and, and all but the most sort of rabid Scottish nationalists and, and Welsh nationalists are oh. actually behind it as well. Because I've spoken to loads of my friends. In fact, my friend Donald McLeod, who was down here uh, this week, we went out for dinner. He was wearing an England shirt on uh, Wednesday night watching the game. So, you know, it's nonsense to say that, oh, in Scotland, they all hate England. They no, don't. No. And I think your theory that actually, uh, if England win on uh, on mm. Sunday night, that actually it's going to be really good for the union. Yeah, I think so. No, I think that's, that's absolutely everyone, right. And, and, it'll be, and it's a, it couldn't, the timing couldn't be better, could it? Because we're coming out of, you know, the wearing of masks. We're coming out of social distancing. It feels as though people are more optimistic now about the future. They've got something to look forward to. I think that's right. And I think, um, you know, the, the, the great mask debate, I think, you know, most of us are very happy to come out of the, uh, uh, wearing the masks. Uh, you know, there is a sort of a, a residual, uh, there was obviously a, a bit of a sort of to-do and, and uh, Keir Starmer and co, they sort of got terribly excited about being reckless. I don't know what's wrong with Keir. Well, I do know what's wrong with him. He's in the <laughs> Labour Party. But I mean, what, I mean, what a complete... The thing is, miss. though, do you know, uh, I think we're being deeply misled mm. by some of these polls. You know, yeah. this YouGov poll that came out uh, saying that whatever it was, 70% of people still wanted to wear masks yeah. or something. I didn't believe it. Right. I haven't believed many of these YouGov polls. Most masks. YouGov polls, I would say, have been wrong. Right. Well, the first thing was this poll was two months old. Mm. They didn't tell us that, did yeah. they? Uh, on the headline. So I actually said, no, I'm going to test this. Mm. So we polled 18,000 of our uh, registered supporters yeah. uh, in Reform UK. And within 36 hours, we had 18,000 replies right. uh, on this survey. And 56% of them said they would ditch the mask immediately. And not wear them again. Immedi and not wear them again. Mm. So, you know, I don't know what um, what these uh, YouGov polls are doing mm. uh, and who they're talking to, but well, I'm, not sure, they're they're I'm not sure they're talking to real well, people. Well, they're asking questions like, um, would you continue to wear a mask if it saves lives? And you're not going to go, no, because I don't care about saving lives, are you? So you're going to go, well, yes. And that's, but, I think, exactly. how they do it. It's, it's the way they you frame ask the question. Whereas, actually, if you frame the question, uh, will you get rid of your mask because we feel that it 
perpetuates a state of fear, yeah. then probably 90% exactly. say, I'll get rid of it. Exactly. And Remember that's that? my concern about these masks. Is, look, if someone wants to wear a mask in enclosed spaces, whatever, that's their freedom mm. of choice. But please don't accuse the rest of us no. of, of in any way, uh, you know, being selfish. Um, actually, it, the, the evidence for the efficacy of wearing masks really is at best weak, even mm. the government's own website. Yeah. The only proper uh, controlled clinical trial uh, on masks that I'm aware of, and I've looked into it, was done in Denmark last year. Yeah. And it shows there's no statistically yeah. significant uh, evidence that they make any no. difference at all, unless you are wearing one of the highest unless quality, unless you're wearing one of those very really high top yeah. quality medical masks, which of course 99% of people got. Are, no, nobody's got. No. So. You know, and I if think, you see somebody wearing one of those in the street, I would say take a wide berth because it's probably some kind <laughs> of something case. wrong with them. Yeah, <laughs> you know, look at some serial killer. But I do think it's part of. I, I think it's part of leadership. I'm delighted finally the government is using the language mm. that the likes of you and I have been using for months. Yes, which is that we've got to learn to live with this. Exactly. Which is that we've got to treat COVID in the same way that we treat f flu. Yeah. You know. Yes, it can be. It, it can be really nasty. Uh, for certain people, yes. but we've got to learn to live mm. with it. But for most people, it's not, and that is the bottom line. That's... Because, you know, without wishing to sound in any way callous, you know, we do not run governments on any other basis uh, for the minority of people who might be injured by something uh, which flies around in the air. Yep. You know, by and large, we govern for the majority of people. And, and we try right. to and, protect the, the and, vulnerable. And you, and, you know, the whole point of leadership is that you've got to motivate, enthuse, encourage, excite, and you've got to give confidence mm whether it's in a business, whether it's leading a sports team, yeah. uh, whether it's, you know, running a charity or running a country. Yeah. And, you know, a nation will do great things if actually it's leaders, uh, you know, drive us forwards yeah. with that with that motivation. Well, and I think also... that's, that's why our leaders have got to say, you know, let's get rid of the masks. Let's, you know, have some have some uh, enthusiasm, have some self-belief. Mm. and put the foot flat on the accelerator. We yeah. need to be in eighth gear as we drive forwards. And maybe, maybe actually the England success, whatever happens on Sunday, yeah. you know, this is a huge success story. Yeah. And that is sort of the pump primer, really. I think so. Uh, you know, to, to push forward. And I think that the, the, the speed with which we then accelerate out of this nonsense will increase because, you know, look at the state of the test and trace now. You've got Keir Starmer asking uh, Boris Johnson, what are you going to do about all these people that are cancelling the app? Well, what can he do? Nothing. Cancel the app. It doesn't work. It doesn't do any good for anybody. And in fact, the Department of Health is now saying that if you are pinged by the NHS COVID-19 app, you are not being told to self-isolate. It's only ever been advisory. Oh, where did that really? come from? I mean, so they've just... now started saying this, right? So, so actually, all of these people, and also this idea that Labour were coming out with, with millions of people are going to have to self-isolate. Well, why? You're only, you're only having to self-isolate because some stupid rule says you do. But this is where the government has got to show some common sense and say, actually, from July the 19th, you know, if you've been double jabbed, it's ludicrous that you should self-isolate mm. again. Right. If you may or may not have been within a few metres yeah. of someone who may or may not have symptoms. Which may or may not mean technology. anything at all. Exactly. You know, you know I mean, so you might have been, I might have been within, you know, two or three metres of somebody who's who's got some dreadful, you know, sexually transmissible disease. You know, I don't know. But, you know, that's life, isn't it? It, it is life. And and I think that, again, uh, you know, what, what, what the, the, the government and leaders have got to say is, yes, case numbers are going up. But the, the, the link between cases and hospitalisations and deaths has been broken. It has clearly yeah. been broken. Thanks because to the, the numbers are of going up of, of, of yeah, so-called cases, but, cases, but in not reality, cases. In reality, we all know, we all know lots of friends who've got children at school uh, or kids who've just come back from university. And yes, uh, the young have got, uh, you know, there are, are, are rising cases. What the government should do is actually release the data about the age range of these in increasing cases. But most people I talk, anecdotally, the kids, they might have a sniffle. Yeah. At worst, they might have something that feels or sounds like flu for yeah. a day. Well, actually, guess what? You're building up natural antibodies. Exactly. That's a good thing. Yeah. I mean, we're looking here at 32,551 daily coronavirus cases, according to the figures in the Telegraph. Seems high, but again, needs context, doesn't it? Because what does that actually mean? It means 32,551 positive tests, effectively, right? Correct. They're saying 35 deaths, uh, which again is a bit maybe higher than it was. It used to be sort of under 20. But still, compared to 1,241 deaths in, of all causes, yep. it's, a, it's a tiny amount. Exactly. I mean, it's just over 2%. Again, and again, context would be good to know context who these would be people good. are. If, if you put that in the context, well, how many people die from flu every day? Mm. It's more than that. Right. How many people die from cancer yeah, every day? it's more than that. Sadly, it's 10 times or 15 times. Yeah. 
that number, you've got to put this in context of life. And, and I think the vast, vast, vast majority of people want to actually to get on. You know, we're only, we're only here once. Life's not a dress rehearsal. And, you know, I think we've got to have the confidence to say, come on, folks, this is the time to say, right, we're going to work hard, we're going to play hard, we're going to get stuff done, mm. we're going to play our part in driving our country forward. Yeah. That's the message that our leaders, our government, have now got to be pushing throughout the whole population. Yeah, and as Julie Hartley Brewer said, you know, it's not perfect, this business of the travel uh, lifting, and the travel restrictions lifting. No, of course it's not. But we are moving in the right direction. So finally, we can be encouraged by saying that, look, you know, the government does now seem to get it. And I loved the fact that Sajid Javid came out and said, you know, I'm the Secretary of State for Health, not the Secretary of State for, Co State for COVID. Yes. Because that's been needed to be said by somebody. It's extraordinary, that, that change in tone and language since he arrived. I mean... Uh, you know, I mean, frankly, uh, Hancock leaving it really has been a complete tonic for the whole nation, uh, as far as I'm concerned. And what does it say about um, Boris, right, that somebody like Matt Hancock was able to control health policy? And I know he's a Secretary of State for Health, but, but over and above whatever Boris wanted. I mean, that's extraordinary, isn't it? Well, it is extraordinary. Let's not forget, of course, you know, Boris actually initially uh, wanted to keep him there. It... Um, the, the whole thing is uh, is quite extraordinary how the, what the nation was literally seemingly being held back by one complete authoritarian control freak. Mm. Anyway, thankfully he's gone and, and sort of it feels like the stars are coming together and, you know, it's a real opportunity for us and we've, we've got to grasp it. We've got to grasp it with, with open hands uh, and, and, and really go forward and, and, you know, the government's just got to now uh, move quickly uh, to change these isolation rules, to lift the further travel restrictions, to stop the rip-off of all this mm. testing. I actually think that we should stop mass testing yes. of children in schools. I think it's a no point. It's a financial rip-off. It's medically irrelevant yes. uh, to be testing, you know, frankly, millions of healthy children uh, who may or may not have a sniffle, uh, and then to be sort of essentially sending whole classes, whole year groups, whole schools home and missing the most vital thing which actually is being educated in schools mm. socializing yeah. with their peers right. in schools you know this is a vital part of the future of our our country you know the young uh, you know learning how to do these things absolutely right richard stay with us for a moment i'm going to give you another reason to celebrate uh, coming up very shortly we are of course talk radio the home of common sense richard tice is here we've got champagne uh, albeit english sparkling wine it is champagne you just can't call it that guess why because the french won't let you Cheers. Cheers. Uh, sparkling wine, I suppose we have to call it. But it's really fizz. I mean, that's what we're going to call it. Now, what I can tell you is there's another reason to celebrate, Richard, because I can't quite reveal, but I will reveal in the next hour uh, that we've got an announcement to make here wow. at Talk Radio, which is going to be very, very exciting. So, Are you taking uh, over? Are you the boss? I can't say. Listen, <laughs> this is what happens when you say, look, I can't tell you. And immediately they go, what is it? I can't say. No, they, don't, no, I, they put me in charge of Radio Station once. Uh, and I was later accused by uh, my current boss of wasting five million pounds of his money. <laughs> But that's not true. Very unfair, you know. Very unfair. It was very unfair. We ran it very well for a short period of time before it was closed down. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everything I've ever run has kind of been closed down. I ran the Scottish edition of Daily Mirror. That got closed down. Um, I worked for the Daily Express when it was really quite good. And now look at it. Um, but, you know, what can you say? Well, what can you say? I mean, maybe you have to take the uh, the advice of the latest army adverts. Fail, learn, win. I quite like that. I quite um, like that. It sounds like, but I don't think in they, terms of running things, maybe this, you've kept on it, failing. This and... particular company is, is rather successful, so I think they probably best keep, just let, let, keep them keep, you let them keep running it. I'll do this. They do that. Everybody's happy. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, Brexit, because I see in the front page of Telegraph, I don't know if you've seen this, final bill for Brexit uh, is expected to be £2 billion higher than expected. Apparently, um, because they're... So, they're giving us more fines. I, it's just what, unbelievable. Why would we bother paying fines to the EU? I've no idea at all. I mean, I, I think we're going to just keep seeing these stories for a variety of reasons. You know, my view is, frankly, until uh, the EU uh, come to their senses and play play ball mm. on the, the really, really critically important issue, which is the Northern Ireland Protocol, yeah. which is, is so damaging to trade in Northern Ireland, mm. so damaging to community relations and the tension there. Until they pay the ball, actually, I wouldn't pay them anything. Yeah. I would say, literally, all bets are off. You're in breach. Yes. Uh, and, and, you know, we've got to sort this out. And I would give them a really, really short time frame. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, we've got to scrap the protocol and, and start again. And just start again and just go, no deal, you yeah. know? Because that mean, would, we, we might as well at this point, right? Well, I always said, you know, actually, uh, and I really liked the, the previous T-Shock before Leo Varadkar, Ender Kenyon, he said... 
with goodwill and technology, you can sort out the issue of goods going across the border. Yeah. Um, but as soon as he left, actually, they they essentially weaponized yes. uh, the, uh, the, the the trade talks and goods moving across the border in order to try and basically punish us with a, and also, a and really bad deal. And that's what happened, and we're still recovering from that. Well, with Veradka, they were almost trying to stop Brexit happening, weren't they? Yeah. So they were using him as the kind of battering ram. Unfortunately, he wasn't very good at it, uh, and, he, and he lost an election. So but, um, so now it's at least an improved situation on that one. Yeah, and I think, but but actually, uh, you know, Boris and Lord Frost, they've really got to stand up to the EU now and say, no, no, we're not going to pay you any more money. We're not going to pay any fines. I mean, that's utterly ridiculous. Mm. Uh, and you've got to sort out this Northern Ireland protocol. And, and frankly, until that is done, everything else, just just press the pause button. Yeah. A bit like the EU did to, the, to us, Barnier did to us, when he said we couldn't even start trade talks until we'd sorted out the size of the divorce bill mm. um, and, um, and, and the EU citizens. Well, we could actually turn the tables back on them and say, no, you've got to sort out the protocol in a couple of weeks, mm. otherwise we're done. We're not paying any more. Uh, you know, all bets are off. They, yeah. They've got to realise that not only are we a sovereign, independent state, we've left. We are going to survive and thrive and succeed on our own. You know, I've always said this is the moment to become literally like Singapore, uh, you know, off off the uh, the coast of Europe. We've got a, a great opportunity. We've got to we've got to cut taxes. We've got to have be smartly regulated, cut daft regulation, put the foot on the accelerator of growth. And, you know, where you get higher growth, you get higher wages, you've got more money to invest in mm. public services. And my goodness me, don't we know that the the, uh, the health service and system is going to lead a lot of yeah. smart investment, not just pouring money into a black hole. Exactly. It needs major reform. And how much would Brussels hate England winning the Euros? Oh, I know. <laughs> I mean, honestly. <laughs> I mean, that would be the icing on the cake, wouldn't it? Yeah, so it would not, be. We're not giving you the £40 billion and we've just won the Euros. How about that? I mean, look, it's... <laughs> It's fun banter, and, and songs. They, 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 of course they would hate it. But I mean, just think how much of a boost it will be to us. Even I think just getting as far as we've got is a, you know, it, it really is oh, an it's extraordinary massive. boost. Yes. And, uh, you know, we've it's such an opportunity. We've got to go for it. And we mustn't in any way show any signs of weakness. You know, this is our moment. Mm. This is our time. It really is. And, it, and, and how appropriate uh, is it that it is our time and that it's happening at the same time uh, as the, everything's sort of coming together. It feels like everything's coming together, doesn't it? It, it, it really does, and, and not before time. Uh, but the question is whether or not the government then actually, you know, they, they, they grasp it and they start making some common sense, quick decisions, mm. you know, to use this. They've been far too slow to use the success of the vaccination rollout, uh, and that's held us back. Um, and hopefully now with, with uh, Sajid Javid in the health department, uh, you know, that really will uh, herald some change. But, you know, we shouldn't underestimate the forces of some of the, the sage scientists, the communists, uh, you know, that are sort oh, of God. embedded within it. Yeah. Um, and the merry-go-round of money and some of the decisions you think, why are they doing that? Mm. It's so illogical. And far too often, it's it's a case of following the money. And it's such a merry-go-round, these, these sage scientists, the research groups, the universities, the quangos, uh, the big pharma companies... Mm. And they're all making a huge amount of money. And that's why they want this thing to go on as long as possible. Yeah, and that's what we must keep a very close eye on. Well, Richard, great to see you. Thank you very much for the uh, for the fizz. Uh, good luck on Sunday. Uh, we wish crossed. everybody good luck on Sunday. I'm sure everybody will be rooting for England, even you Scots up there. I know you will. Uh, you really mean it, don't you?